I'd like to introduce our first speaker. His name is Dr. Sarush Zaghi. He's going to be speaking on a brief history of case and clinical studies in sleep and airway disorders from tracheotomy to phrenectomy and beyond. Dr. Zaghi graduated from Harvard Medical School. He completed his residency in ENT, otolaryngology, head and neck surgery at UCLA, sleep surgery fellowship at Stanford University. The focus of his subspecialty training is on the comprehensive treatment of nasal obstruction, snoring, and obstructive sleep apnea. He's very active in clinical research relating to sleep disordered breathing with over 70 peer-reviewed research publications in the fields of neuroscience, head and neck surgery, sleep disordered breathing. Dr. Zaghi is particularly interested in studying the impact of tethered oral tissues such as tongue tie and oral myofascial dysfunction on maxillofacial development, upper airway resistance syndrome, and obstructive sleep apnea. He's an invited lecturer, author, journal reviewer for topics relating to the diagnosis and management of sleep disordered breathing and tongue tie disorders. I'd like to welcome Dr. Zaghi. Thank you very much for that uh, wonderful introduction. And uh, I really want to thank uh, Peter and the uh, um, American Laser Study Club for hosting such an amazing uh, meeting. So if you guys give us all a round of applause for the organizers of this meeting, from Anya to Peter and everyone else who was really uh, instrumental in making this happen. And also, I really want to congratulate all of you for being here and for being pioneers in this field. And as being pioneers in a field, it can sometimes be challenging because you get a lot of resistance from your colleagues. And so as we move forward, um, I think it's important to realize where we came from. How do we get to this point where we're treating tongue ties and myofunctional therapy, sleep and breathing? And the best way to do that is to take a, a step back and to look at how we all got here. My name is Saroosh Zaghi. I graduated from Harvard Medical School. I did my ENT residency training at at, uh, at UCLA, and then I went on to do a fellowship at Stanford where I became a specialist in sleep and breathing issues. Here at Stanford, I learned to, to, about sleep medicine, sleep dentistry, ENT, maxillofacial surgery, and the myofunctional sciences. Since that time, I now work at the Breathe Institute where we take a structural and functional approach to sleep and breathing issues and really pushing the envelope, really advancing the standard of care. When we talk about standard of care for issues with sleep and breathing, really the gold standard to, uh, for maximum efficacy and power, the end all, is really the maxillary mandibular advancement surgery. And so MMA will physically open up the airway by bringing the jaw bones forward. And yes, it does improve the airway and sleep apnea by 65 to 80%. But it's only about one third of patients who go through a bunch of treatments to get up to this point, who, are, who get cured after the surgery. And a lot of what we're seeing is that there are functional issues that are causing residual issues and that may be contributing to the problem in the first place. And so my specialty now works on using uh, phrenectomy to treat patients with myofunctional disorders. And so here's one myofunctional disorder, which is a low tone tongue. And so in the video, you can see that she's trying to stick out her tongue, but her, her tongue is very weak. Her whole face is just really weak. Her jaws are weak, and this is while she's awake. While she's awake, she can barely hold up her tongue. So you can only imagine what happens as she goes from light sleep to deep sleep and all the muscles in the body uh, relax. Go ahead, open screen. And so it's this really this, this tongue, tongue restriction, tone restriction that comes into play when we're talking stick about um, sleep and breathing disorders. So let's just start off with a funny little bit about how these issues can really affect people. I, I suffer from this thing called sleep apnea. Okay? If you don't know what sleep apnea is, just ask one of the nurses inside the building. <laughs> They'll tell you. It's a form of snoring, only it's worse. It's worse than snoring. I choke when I sleep. And I'm loud. I'm so loud that I wake myself up. And you gotta see the way I sleep, it's disgusting. Like, this is, what, this, is how, this is what I look like when I sleep. Ha! 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 Who is it? Who's out there? I 
didn't know I had sleep apnea. My mom told me I had sleep apnea. I was asleep at her house about six years ago, sleeping in the guest room, the same way I always do, just like this. Ha! Ha! And I woke up. My mom's at the foot of the bed like this. Oh my God, jaw sand. You're dying. Go, Mom, I'm not dying, I'm snoring. Joseph, that is not snoring. You look like this. <laughs> Joseph, you have to go to a doctor and get that check out. I'm telling you, you're going to die, and I don't want you to die, Joseph, because I'll die of heart attack if you die. Oh my God, Joseph, get that. Mom, I'm not going to go to a doctor for snoring. How long are you watching me? That's creepy. And I kicked her up. Get out of here. Get out of here, Mom. I'm sorry, Joseph. I did not mean to startle you. It's just that I was walking to the kitchen and I heard a noise coming from the guest room. It sounded like someone was killing a bear. <laughs> and I was like, I don't have a bear. So I opened the door and I noticed that it was just you, Joseph. <laughs> snoring. So I'm sorry. You don't have to go to a doctor. Just go to sleep. Go to sleep. <laughs> and die. I, I... So this comedy is, is really funny. When, when this little story is really funny when it's part of a comedy special, a Netflix special, a Comedy Central special. But it's not funny at all when, when a patient like this walks into your office and cries and tears up to you about how this has impacted his life, not being able to sleep comfortably, breathe comfortably, and having to suffer with a, with a CPAP mask each and every, every night of his life just to sleep and breathe. And so it makes us take a step back and appreciate the role of the tongue in sleep disordered breathing. When you're sleeping, you should be breathing through your nose and down your throat. But as you go from light sleep to deep sleep, all the muscles in the body relax. And there are muscles in the throat and even the tongue that relax. And in patients who suffer from snoring and sleep disorders, it relaxes to such an extent that it actually narrows the airway. And when it narrows the airway, it causes turbulence of airflow, and that causes snoring. But if it closes up all the way, that's when you have sleep apnea. Now, how do tongue tie issues uh, um, play a role in sleep disorder breathing? Well, the tongue, a tongue tie, is when the tongue is physically tethered to the floor of the mouth. The tongue is tied down to the floor of the mouth. So the tongue is tied down, down and into the airway, narrowing the throat. And so what our goals are when we're doing lingual phrenectomies is to get the tongue up and out of the throat. And so if you look at this little girl, which we classify as a grade four tongue tie tethered all the way to the tip, you'll notice that before treatment, she'll have very noisy breathing. Open mouth, noisy, on her side, with a low tongue position. And just four days after treatment, the mom sends us this video. She can't even hear her. Quiet, peaceful, restful sleep. So this is a case I had almost two or three years ago, and it took just that long for me to turn this from a case that I saw into a case report. And so now this is actually the first paper that's published in a medical journal that talks about the fact that tongue and lip ties can potentially help mouth breathing and snoring. Now, what I've described here may not surprise any of you that tongue and lip ties can, can, can actually work because it all starts with the expert opinion and there's a lot of knowledge here in this room. But in order to take it to the next step, we have to get our colleagues and counterparts in the research fields on board. And that's why I have so much respect for the American Laser Study Club because we want to be science and evidence-based. And so they invited me here today 
to talk to you guys about levels of evidence and how we can work together to take it to the next step. So the first step starts with expert opinion. That's your experience that you guys have in each of your clinics, the patients you see day in and day out. But the next step is a case report. It's actually putting that out there so others can learn from your experience. So I had this report that's also about two years ago where it was a 60-year-old female with severe headaches, jaw tension, sleep problems, forward head posture, nothing foreign to any of you. After treatment, this is what she looks like two years later. With a complete rejuvenation of her face, body, and spirit, simply with myofunctional therapy and, and a tongue tie release. And so I was really proud of this. And I wanted to share it, and I shared it with some of my top colleagues in the field of, of sleep and International Sleep Surgery Society, and I was so excited. And you know what kind of feedback I got? Okay, so this... Sarush, I will be honest and say, I think you are better than this one patient testimonial would suggest. Anecdotal experiences like this can form the basis of scientific evaluation, but it is pretty useless, useless in itself. I would strongly recommend that you develop an evidence basis with higher quality science than this example. How many people have been in a situation like this where, where you know your treatment works, you see it day in and day out, and all your colleagues can say is that there's no evidence. There's no evidence. And so my rebuttal is that this evidence starts from the ground. It starts from the observations that you're making, and it starts with case reports. And from case reports, you go on to case series. So here's one case. We described Madeline's case, doing great tongue mobility, sleeping better, swallowing better, eating better. Well, here's another and case. 11-year-old girl, girl, sleep disorder breathing and depressed mood issues. Here she is the next day. Totally different personality in school, making friends. Here's another case where I get an email, a, a message in the middle of the night from the mom, so happy that she has her baby back. And, and what makes me most proud is for my colleagues when we teach them how to do these procedures and they give you the same kind of results. So my colleague, Dr. Ryan Roberts, released this case and the father says, this is the first time I've ever seen him sleep with his mouth closed. How powerful is that? And how about these cases where you follow them and after the release, the amazing transformation, just tongue tie release and myofunctional therapy. So now, now you're, now you're pers being more persuasive. Now it's not just one case. It's a bunch of cases. And so now you have level four evidence. You have a series of cases to back you up. And so these series of cases are non-consecutive. We're, we're, we're picking out the cases among patients who share a common theme, but in all honesty, what you're gonna hear is that there's selection bias. I did treatment on a bunch of patients, and I'm only showing you the ones that work. And so there's validity to that that yes, now we have level four, but there can be some bias. I may be picking out the cases. So a better way of doing it, to challenge your colleagues, to have more internal validity, is to do a bunch of consecutive cases and to do it prospectively. You're gonna say, I'm gonna measure the outcomes of all my tongue tie releases moving forward for this group of patients and report all the results, not just hand picking one, two, or three here and there. And that's what we did in our, in our uh, paper that's going to be published this year that shows 350 cases that we followed prospectively looking at how did they do. And you can learn a lot from this. We learned that, yes, we improved the overall tongue mobility and, and some snoring issues, but patients are coming back and reporting release of tension in the neck and shoulder. They're sleeping better. They're swallowing better. They're having better nasal breathing. And so this is how we're pushing, pushing the envelope, advancing, advancing the research. And so level three evidence is an analytical study. This is different than case reports and case series. Case reports and case series are descriptive studies. They're describing what happens, but you can't really do any statistics on it. You need to have a level three study in order for it to be analytical. But really what a lot of providers are looking for is this randomized controlled trial, the gold standard. And they'll consider any study that doesn't have randomized control to be quasi-experimental. So even if you go through all this trouble, do these prospective studies, you're going to say, well, that's not really experimental. 
And it really de depends on the different journals and the societies out there how they're going to grade and rank these levels of evidence of research. And so some people, no matter how much evidence you put in front of them, will tell them, well, that's not good enough. There's no proof. There's no randomized control trials. There's bias. There's selection bias. And this bias. Well, I said, hey, hey, let's take a look at what kind of evidence we have in sleep apnea in general. What's all the evidence for everything else that we're doing that you're being so critical with tongue tie myofunctional disorders, right? That's what we did in this paper. We said, all right, what's the evidence in the best journals? What are the four best ENT journals and what are the four best sleep journals? We're not just saying pay to publish journals, we're saying the most rigorously certified, peer-reviewed, editorial board, what do you guys have to show in your journals? And we see that, yes, there's a lot of these better journals are, are publishing more prospective instead of retrospective, and I give it to them. You don't want to just pick a case here and there. You want to say what your hypothesis is and move forward, because otherwise you're going to bias yourself and you're just kind of picking cases and you're hiding your, your failures and you're promoting your successes, and we don't want to do that. So we do want our research to be prospective. But randomized control trials is just like a, like, a, like a blip in the map. And if you look at these top eight journals across the fields of ENT, sleep, and, and medicine, and, 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 uh, and sleep medicine, most of the studies they're publishing are level four studies in the best of the best journals. Okay? And it's only six, six to nine percent that they're actually doing these level one randomized control trials. So, so what's this about? Why is there such resistance and such negative feedback to a field that's up and coming and developing so rapidly? Because it's here, it's down here that new ideas are, are, are developed. And the top is just to kind of confirm what you already know. So if you're doing a randomized controlled trial, you're not coming up with anything new. Everything is so controlled that you can't learn anything new out of it. All you can do is confirm something that you already know. So let's take a step back and be proud of where we are because the evidence, uh, if we look at the evidence for tongue and sleep and breathing, you'll be very, very proud about the progress that we're making so quickly. And so when people ask for, for uh, literature and evidence in the field of sleep and breathing, the one person that be exciting to follow is Dr. Christian Guillemino. Anyone here familiar with Dr. Guillemino? Wonderful. So as you guys know, Dr. Guimino is, is a physician and researcher who actually played a, a central role in even discovering sleep apnea. He developed the field of sleep medicine. He made the first groups. He made the first journal on sleep, 600 peer-reviewed articles. And you know what he's been studying the last 10 years? Myofunctional therapy and tongue-tie disorders. And so here's a, a, a poster when I was doing fellowship there. It was just kind of in like the storage, and I thought I'd take a picture of it showing uh, his accolades throughout the years. You guys may or may not know this, but Dr. Guillemino was the first person to come up with the term obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. He was the first person to come up with upper airway resistance syndrome. And with, along with William DeMent, he was the first person to come up with the apnea hypopnea index that we use today. And he came up with these. Do you know how long ago? 40 to 45 years ago, and that's it. Before 45 years ago, there was no such thing as obstructive sleep apnea. Sure, people had known about it, and they'd known about it since 1836 in this, in this book by Charles Dickens, The Pickwick Club, in which there was monthly installments like a sitcom in a novel version where they follow along the characters, and there's this one character, Joe the Fat Boy, who just ate all the time, he got really big, and he was sleepy. He would just sleep all the time. The book goes on to say that there was a, 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 a wonderfully fat boy, and he's standing there, and if you say sleep, he falls to sleep. How funny and odd is that? 1836, first case report. This fat boy finally had an experience in which he went to seek hospital care. He loved to play poker once a week, and on one hand, he got dealt a full house. But even though he had this exciting hand, he fell asleep, and he knew there was a problem, and so he went to the hospital. 
1836, the first time that we know that sleep and breathing issues can be medically dangerous and should probably be treated. So it took from 1836, where it was already out there in small books and journals here, till the 1970s, until they actually studied this. Almost 150 years it took them to describe this phenomenon. And they described it quite incidentally. Dr. Kimino was working at Stanford in 1972, where he got hired there to learn about sleep and dreaming, not even sleep disorder breathing. But he'd go to conferences like this. And he heard that there were a bunch of Italian cardiologists who could measure changes in blood pressure during the night among people who snored. They thought that was super, super interesting. So he persuaded the cardiologists in his hospital to stay up all night and record the blood pressure of the, of the patients who were snoring in, uh, in that hospital, hospital unit. And by doing that, they found out that there's something called sleep apnea syndrome, in which it's apnea that's induced by sleep with secondary cardiovascular consequences. The primary respiratory mechanism is completely undetectable when they're awake, and it happens when they're asleep. But even though he reported this in 350 patients, there are other medical centers who tried to reproduce it, and they, and they quite couldn't because they didn't have the same standards. In any case, they kept pushing forward and saying, obstructive sleep apnea is real. Other centers saying, you're making this up. It's not real. There's no evidence for it. And so what they went on to do is to show that it's a real thing. And how did they show it? They did a cohort study. Now this is level three evidence, pushing up the evidence ladder, right? And so they took 15 patients with this sloop-induced apnea, and they either did medical treatment with atropine or surgical treatment. Surgical treatment with a tracheostomy. You guys familiar with the tracheostomy? This is essentially a breathing tube that bypasses the airway and allows you to breathe at night. And so what we have here is an outstanding high level of control study in which the patient has apnea during sleep, arrhythmias, and after the trachea, perfect, doing great. And then you can take it a step further. You can keep it open and their blood and their arrhythmia, I'm sorry, they're doing great. You close the trach and they get arrhythmia as they're unstable. You open the trach and they're doing great. You close it and they're unstable. So now we're pushing forward, we're pushing forward the research, right? And to this day, there's still no randomized control trial. And the highest level of evidence for trach is two. That's the highest you could be. You can't get more control than that. Turn it on, turn it off. And if you look, look at these impressive results. Starting with AHIs in the 60s and 80s and 90s, down to zeros, ones. Can't beat that. To, to get a 100% success rate in every patient, wow. What a treatment. What a treatment. So in 1980, a construction worker comes along. He has severe sleep apnea. And he went to Dr. Cullivan, Sullivan's office in Australia. And he's like, you know what? Ugh, this trach thing, I don't know. I'll do anything else. I will do anything else. And these are the same patients who are showing up in your clinics, who are being offered jaw surgery and UPPP surgery, this and that. And they're saying, I heard about that, but I'll do anything else. Can you offer me something less invasive, less morbid, that might help? And so that's what Colin Sullivan did. Colin Sullivan said, hey, maybe instead of bypassing the airway, we can use a breathing tube, a reverse vacuum, to keep it open. And this is where they came up with the CPAP. And so actually, the first studies of CPAP were in dogs. And so they had these dogs, these, pudge, these, these, uh, these kind of pugs, that had really compressed airways, just like you have in, in humans with the maxillofacial complex is reset. The droopy nose, they just can't breathe, and they can't sleep. And he put CPAP on them. And you know what happened? <laughs> it was extremely promising. The dog wagged his tail, leaped outside, unearthed every bone he ever buried, and he even gave a double thumbs up. 
So Dr. Sullivan went on to phase two, determining if it would work in humans. So where did we start with CPAP? We started with animal studies, okay? And animal studies are level six evidence. These are foundational. They don't even make it up to the case report or case series. So here we are in 1981. The first case series of five patients who had CPAP as an alternative to tracheostomy. And let's say you're here in the 1980s, only 40 years ago, only 40 years ago that CPAP was invented. And you had to choose between the level two evidence, level one, two evidence for tracheostomy, or the level four evidence for CPAP, which would you choose? And that's where we are today with tongue tie. Of course, the standard of care has been the standard of care. Of course, there's gonna be higher levels of evidence for that. But it's down here where new ideas are made. This is where new ideas are birthed. Because if you come to the top, you won't be able to get a successful study. You have to start from the bottom and come to the top. So that's in adults. In children, sleep apnea was discovered 1976, nearly like 45 years ago. And at the time, the only treatment that they really had was tonsillectomy surgeries, taking out the tonsils. It wasn't until 2004, only 15 years ago, that they realized that, hey, we do the tonsillectomy, but in some cases, they still have issues. They still have problems. In at least 15% of cases, they still have sleep apnea issues. This was only 15 years ago. And it was only eight years ago that they realized that the jaws could be involved, that the maxilla could be retreated that the mandible could be set back. And that's what they did in this study. They looked at 400 kids with sleep disordered breathing, and 72% of them had large tonsils. But almost all of them had a small mandible or high narrow palate or retronathia. So for the first time recognizing that this is why they have sleep apnea, rather than the large tonsils. And it was only seven years ago that they did the first studies on maxillary uh, extraction, rapid palatal expansion. It was seven years ago. Look at how much progress we're making so quickly. And in this study, what they did is they randomized them to tonsils and adenoids first or orthodontic treatment first. And what they found is that it's not one or the other. It's actually both, and, it, and it's in the right context. If you have big tonsils, you have to get the tonsils out. If you have a narrow maxilla, get the narrow maxilla out. And both are important. So what they did in 2013, look at the quick progress that we're making in this field. 24 children were cured with adenotonsillectomy and or orthodontia as, 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 as needed. Half of them were referred from, all of them were referred for myofunctional therapy. Half of them completed therapy and three years later, none of them had any sleep apnea with HI 0.5. Among those who did not pursue therapy, they're all coming back with moderately severe sleep apnea. So what does this tell us? That even if you do the tonsils and the adenoids and the orthodontic work, if you don't do the therapy, if you don't become a continuous nasal breather, you're at high risk of relapse and perpetuation of the sleep disorder breathing. And it was only four years ago that we published this meta-analysis on myofunctional therapy that's led to this burgeoning of training in this field, showing that myofunctional therapy significantly helps improve the AHI in children and adults, improving sleepiness and snoring in children and adults of all ages. And we're now learning with different protocols how to do this therapy and what the goals are, to get the lips together, to get the tongue up on the palate, and make sure our kids and adults are doing exclusive nasal breathing. Because when the tongue is up, it's out of the airway. And when the tongue is down, it's going to block the airway. And this is what myofunctional therapy does. It strengthens and tones the tongue. So the tongue is sitting up against the roof of the mouth, not low and back in the airway. You want your tongue up like this. And this is what we want for our babies with natural optimal tongue mobility, just up. But you might have a tongue tie. And the tongue tie can force you down. And you won't be able to get your tongue up. And it was only four years ago that tongue tie was recognized as a potential phenotype for sleep apnea. And so what they did in this study is they take 150 patients and they divided them into groups with short or normal frenulums, a case control study. 
They measured their tonsil size, malampati tongue position, and whether or not they had a high arch palate. And they found that, in fact, there are different phenotypes of sleep apnea. Some kids come in with the large tonsils and the so-so malampati, not really high arch palate, and they have an AHI of 11.4. And other kids come in not big tonsils at all. These kids come in with high arch palate and tongue tie issues, and they tend to be even more severe. It was only two years ago that we published this article showing that tongue tie could be related to this narrowness in the maxillary arch. And so what we did in this study is we measured tongue mobility and we measured the, 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 how U or V-shaped the maxillary arches and we saw a clear distinction in those who had tongue tie issues and those who didn't, as well as the length of the soft palate. Now providing evidence, now understanding that if you have one of these tongue ties, it's going to force the tongue in a down position and it's going to cause you to be narrow instead of wide. But that's not where the story ends. It's not only about tongue tie. We don't want to fall in that mistake where we're doing trachs on everyone, where we're doing tongue tie releases on everyone, right? Because that's where we are in the field now. We have some exciting results, but we have to kind of take it easy a little bit and realize that these tongue tie issues only account for 7% of the variance when it comes to developing the maxillofacial complex. So yes, it's important, but it's not the only thing that's important. Because mouth breathing can also develop this, and this is 2018. What happens is that if you have mouth breathing, this is going to cause local inflammation. The local inflammation is going to cause your tonsils to get enlarged. Tonsils, adenoids get enlarged, more difficult to breathe through your nose, abnormal facial growth, more mouth breathing. And you need your tongue to be up. When your tongue is up, you'll only be able to breathe through your nose. You guys can try it out. The only way to breathe through your mouth is with the tongue down. So now we know that yes, tongue tie keeps the tongue down, but so does mouth breathing. So do learned habits. And so we don't want to jump and just do tongue tie releases on everyone, but rather we want to train the tongue position. Because when the tongue is up, it'll function well to the scaffold. It'll push the teeth all where they have to be. But when the tongue is down, it'll be dysfunctional as a scaffold. And the teeth will all come in crooked. And they come in crooked, and these kids will present to you with dental crowding and high arch palates, such that if you have low tongue position, it's going to contribute to the high arch palate. It's going to make you have a narrow nasal cavity. And when you have a narrow nasal cavity, that'll make you more susceptible to septal deviations. So if you have somebody, a little kid, with a tongue tie, and it goes undiagnosed, you might get someone with recurrent sinus infections, tightness in the neck and shoulders, TMJ pain, sleep issues, and anxiety depression issues due to chronic fatigue. I had had um, a number of problems throughout my life which I had um, tried to address with braces, with getting my tonsils removed, with all sorts of uh, treatments and finally I went to a dentist uh, in Los Angeles almost ready to do another round of braces and he referred me here to, to Dr. Zaghi. Um, and I did six weeks of myofunctional therapy, um, and a tongue tie release, and then six more weeks, which, you know, is still continuing. Um, but already I can tell that I can breathe so much easier. My neck, before, my neck was tensing up, um, I mean, to the point where I could see the tendons, which other people could see the tendons popping out of my neck. Um, and that's, you know, completely gone, basically. Um, I can speak a lot easier, I feel like. I just am more relaxed in general. So, yeah, I would highly recommend uh, to anyone who is uh, having trouble diagnosing exactly what is wrong with them, uh, trying uh, and seeing if this is maybe the answer. And so we were so happy for them and so happy for our patients, but then I had a father come in, he's an orthodontist, and he comes in with the literature. This doesn't add up for him. He wants to see the proof. And so he picked up the proof from Dr. Christian Guimineau, the only paper that was published up until this point, 
talking about release of frenulums and sleep apnea. It's the only paper out there. And what do you think this paper says? Does it help or does it not help? Actually, it says that it may not. 27 patients with short lingual frenulum and sleep disordered breathing. Mean age, 11, between 2 and 16 years. These kids presented with sleep disordered breathing, snoring, poor sleep, fatigue, but also had a short lingual frenulum and may have had speech swallowing issues particularly early in life. 10 of them had large tonsils and were referred for tonsil adenectomy and phrenectomy. Eight had normal sized tonsils and were only referred for phrenectomy. Nine were referred for orthodontics and phrenectomy. Of those who had the tonsils, phrenectomy was performed eight out of 10 times. Five out of eight had isolated phrenectomy. And none of the children who were sent to the orthodontics had these phrenectomies performed. So what do the results show? That all children improved whether phrenectomy was performed or not with the tonsils or the orthodontics. Only two children, only two, treated both with tonsillectomy and phrenectomy had complete resolution of abnormal mouth breathing. The rest, all 25 others, persisted with abnormal mouth breathing, including all five children that were treated with isolated phrenectomy. So we're saying tongue tie issues fix, this, fix, fix these problems, but it didn't do it in this case. So these 25 people with residual mouth breathing were referred for myofunctional therapy and a phrenectomy if not yet performed. Of the 11 patients who, per, who, who followed up, uh, four children with isolated phrenectomy, two with prior tonsillectomy who then proceeded with phrenectomy, and five with orthodontics, all 11 patients, 100% improvement to mouth breathing. So the only paper that's out there on phrenectomy for short frenulum says that it helps, but it's insufficient to resolve it. And that phrenectomy alone may not be able to restore normal nasal breathing during sleep particularly if the frenulum related problem has lingered over many years. And it's myofunctional therapy that's really playing the important role. And so what we did in this study that we're about to publish is the phrenectomy with myofunctional therapy. And it's by combining the two, the therapy and the surgical procedure, that we're able to get satisfaction results of 91%, quality of life improvement of 87%. And so while we had a lot of satisfaction, we had some people who were neutral and a few who were dissatisfied. Many people that we helped improve the quality of life, but at least 12% who didn't experience a different, and at least a few who were worse. Okay? So we're not done yet. We're not done. Because even though we're getting results of 65 to 80% improvement in some patients who have this, there are other patients who we've learned do worse after getting these tongue tie release procedures done. Here's a patient who had an HI of 17 and went down to 56 after I cut into her tongue tie. And why is that? She had a limited airway and the tongue tie wasn't her issue. We don't want to go in there and just release everybody, release everybody. We want to be very specific about who we're releasing. We want to release tongue ties on individuals with a really tight freedom that's restricting their ability to get their tongue up into the roof of the mouth. We want to get people who have low tongue posture, where the tongue is down. Can you guys see this okay? Can you guys turn on the light, down the lights for a second? This is an important slide. Is it coming? Wait another. 20 seconds. In any case, the tongue here is down here, down here, and then immediately afterwards, tongue goes up. You guys see the difference there? And that's his new natural t resting tongue position uh, after, after the release. So what you want to treat, you know, we go back and forth. So this is immediately before. You can see the tongue tie right there holding the tongue down. This is what it looked like. And now the tongue goes up. And you want to make sure they have enough space in their mouth for this release. So he has enough space here. Because if they're really restricted, you could actually harm them instead of helping them. So you can turn the lights back on. So just for a summary, 1972, almost 47 years ago, that sleep apnea was even mentioned. Okay? It took four years for them to describe pediatric sleep apnea. 1980s is when they started having treatments even for this condition. 81 is when CPAP came, nine years later. 95 is when CPAP came for PEDS OSA. 
And it wasn't until about 30 years later that they're realizing that, hey, peds and adults is different, tonsils and adenoids isn't enough, tonsils and ortho is not enough, tonsils, ortho, phrenectomy is still not enough, that myofunctional therapy must be the missing link. But look at how much more quickly the progress is being made. And so 2013 to 15, myofunctional therapy is the key, but tongue tie can get in the way. Tongue tie can cause high arch narrow palates. Myofunctional therapy and frenuloplasty, but that's not it. It's choosing the right patients. And so with that, I wanna, I wanna thank you guys for your interest in this topic and really, uh, really encourage you guys to go out there and keep pushing forward, collecting the research, publishing your results, and uh, really helping out our patients by working together. Thank you for having me. I have a few minutes, so I'm happy to take any questions, and then we'll give the mic back to Peter. Any questions for me? Yes. That's wonderful, and uh, chiropractic intervention definitely uh, plays a big, big role. In our studies, we do include uh, body work into it, and I think that we really need to get this out there. We really need to start publishing case reports and case series, and even doing prospective studies on this. So there's definitely expert opinion. It works, we see it, but we just need to publish it out there. Yeah, please. The failure was about, I think, four or five millimeters. Yeah. Uh, at least one centimeter, ten, so ten millimeters. Uh, this is this is where we have to do the research, and it's not out yet. But that's what we're kind of thinking. All right. Yes. Great question. So the question is about obesity playing a role in sleep and breathing, and we see that sleep and breathing issues are multifactorial. It often starts with the retruded maxillofacial complex. Then they're not sleeping well. When you're not sleeping well, you get elevated cortisol, inflammatory markers, your whole body metabolism changes so that it's, it makes you gain weight. So it's going to be very difficult to lose weight unless you resolve the, resolve the issue. Uh, certainly, uh, weight loss uh, of about 10 to 20 percent can create 50 to 75% improvement, and it's definitely recommended. So if you have someone who's overweight, you know it's not just a tongue tie ortho issue. They're also gonna have to bring down that weight. And so you wanna approach this from a multidisciplinary perspective. Okay, all right. Well, thank you again for your attention this morning, and I hope you have an excellent rest of your conference.